Hello there, sword friends. More specifically, hello to all you new sword friends out there. I was recently mentioned in a video by Cerberus Arms. Uh, he did a video where he talked about a $200 sword versus a $2,000 sword and offered some tips and tricks to spotting fakes. And so first, thanks for mentioning me in that video, Cerberus Arms, tip of my hat to you. And also, I, well, my subscriber count has jumped by about 30% in the last week. And in that week, I've been asked a number of questions that make me believe uh, the vast majority of people joining the channel are not necessarily super sword aficionado enthusiast folks, but maybe folks that just think katanas are cool and want to know more about them and maybe want to buy one and don't know what to spend their money on. So uh, I'm going to try and help out with that specific question. So this video is not about antiques or high-end customs or anything like that. It's really going to be about uh, people that maybe just want a sword, functional or not, and want to spend, you know, I'm going to focus on less than 500 bucks. And I'm going to talk about some of the options that are out there. So I'll go to a manufacturer website that offers a mass customization sword. Say, you know, custom, maybe in air quotes, and that's because the, the swords you buy aren't necessarily bespoke to you. They're maybe pre-made or made like many others, and then they have already pre-made fittings that you can kind of pick and choose your colors and bits and bobs and assemble them in a way that at least feels unique or, or is more bespoke to you. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk about that. I'll go through one of those websites, go through the options, explain you know, what the what they are, what they do, what the pros and cons are, and, and kind of give you some my take on my hands-on experience that I've, I've had thus far with a bunch of swords. So that's the plan. Anyway, I hope that that bit is interesting. If you're not a person that wants a sub $500 sword to whack shit in the backyard because you think they're cool, um, then you can certainly tune out or you can stay and drop some wisdom in the commentary down below if you think I missed anything or have anything to add or more importantly, correct if I fuck it up. So that's the intent here. Hopefully it's interesting and I'll I'll get on with it. Uh, the first question I would recommend you think when you're buying a sword is what do you actually want to do with it? Now, uh, at least for the folks that I'm talking to in this specific kind of niche, uh, that might sound like a simple question, but it, it might not be necessarily. One, do you want it to be functional? Do you want to be able to cut things in the backyard? Uh, do you want it to be a dangerous weapon or do you want something that's fantasy or do you want something that's functional fantasy or do you want something that's dull, something that looks like a sword, is balanced like a sword, but isn't? So. Uh, I'll talk quickly. If you're looking for a dull sword that might not be dangerous terribly because you have children, there's a few examples of the Aito that you can get there, dull swords. they Sometimes they're made out of zinc aluminum, so if your kids get handsy with them, they're not going to cut themselves. I wouldn't necessarily recommend handing them to them, depending on how, uh, you know, <laughs> how responsible they are with sword-like objects, because it still hurts to get whacked with a metal stick. Um, but the point is that you can get things that aren't as dangerous and and in that case you can get something that is balanced like a sword that isn't necessarily something you have to worry as much about as you would a, a you know a four foot razor blade uh the next bit is fantasy and this is going to be real quick because not a lot of the questions i've got have been around fantasy but there has been a slight influx of questions about what about the cloud buster sword or this anime sword or that some of the manufacturers if the anime sword is at least within you know human wieldable portions proportions you can have some of the custom manufacturers that i'm working with make a custom iteration like that sword and get a functional version but generally speaking if you're looking at under hundred dollars on ebay the vast majority of swords for the cloud buster sword or the zelda sword are not functional replicas if you see anything made out of stainless steel it usually says 440 or 440c is the kind of nomenclature that often gets used with stainless steel um, it's fine for wall art and if you like it buy it just don't buy it with the expectation that you can use it as a functional sword or, or in an oh shit moment or in a zombie apocalypse it's not really going to do the job well and if it does you're just kind of tempting fate some of those swords will cut i've seen a number of youtube videos of people buying a cheap ass sword and whacking stuff with it and it's just fine uh, but again the sword steel isn't really meant to do it. it it can be very soft or very brittle and in either case it's just not not an ideal uh material to, to use for swords, at least not the way it's, it's often tempered and used in those relatively inexpensive things. The other bit that you have to worry about isn't just the sword steel, but how the handle is constructed. Very often they're not made with very robust reinforced tangs or full tangs uh, and, and can kind of break off under the hilt somewhere and become a helicopter of death. So uh, fantasy stuff. If you're interested in fantasy stuff, think about it as wall art. Buy it if you like it. But if you're buying it with the expectation of it being functional, be very cautious and make sure that it's built with, with that expectation in mind, which very often the vast majority of them aren't big telltale sign 440 stainless steel anyway that's the last i'm going to talk about dulls and fantasy stuff because i think the vast majority of questions at least that i'm getting are about swords and their features and all that kind of stuff as it relates to a sharp sword that you can use um so that's what i'm going to talk about i'm going to talk about sharp katanas that you can use and 
to that end, I will say, kind of spoiler alert, my recommendation for new people that want to whack shit in the backyard, uh, hopefully with with responsibility and <laughs> and some degree of control, uh, is to get a through hardened blade. There's there's different types of blades which I'll discuss, but through hardened basically means that there's no hamon on it necessarily, at least not a real one, and it's just going to be more forgiving. So uh, a 1060 to 1095 or 5160 through hardened blade. I've had a lot of luck with the Ronin Dojo Pro series, um, a lot, the Hanway Raptor series. There's a number of different swords out there that are made from that type of material. I find them to be very resilient, very well built, and, and will basically stand up to some shenanigans. Um, so if you want a quick recommendation of what to get that'll work in an oh shit moment and fun in the backyard and is, is not terribly expensive, there's a couple. Um, the other kind of quick advice I'd give you is buy a sword that you're comfortable using. So again, one of the common questions I get right away is, I want a sword that looks cool on the wall, but that I can use in an oh shit moment. Um, or the zombie apocalypse. Well, if you mean that, then train with it. And I don't mean that you have to go to official instruction or, or break the bank or you're, you know kill your time, but move it around, whack things with it. Uh, practice with the weapon, otherwise you're not going to have any proficiency when you need it. And to that end, the first sword I'd recommend you get is one that you're comfortable with fucking up. That's the short answer. Um, if, if that budget is none, then wait until you have a budget. There are $50 swords out there. I've reviewed them. Musashi makes a through hardened 1045 katana that's fine to whack into stuff and get the the dumb uh stuff out some training stuff and if you buy a sword for 50 bucks learn what you can from it get the you know whacking logs and katanas are indestructible stupidity out of your system do that then don't feel bad because you spent 50 bucks i mean it's still 50 bucks and that's not nothing but you'll feel better than if you spent 500 bucks on a sword and did the same dumb shit and broke your sword so uh do that Learn from the experience, learn what is, is you like and don't like, and then spend more money. Get something that is uh, better suited to the style or taste that you, you know you now have in a sword. Uh, I know katanas can all look the same at a distance. There's some differences between them, how they handle dynamically, some of their intention. Uh, what you prefer, if you prefer something stout and very hardy and well-built to whack into tree logs that'll sustain, or something very, very nimble that can, can kind of get in and out, uh, uh, you know, very agilely, so to speak. So the point is, uh, buy a sword that you're not afraid to use and then use it, learn about it. And, you know, a $50 sword, I, I showed what a $50 sword can do and it's it's quite a lot. <laughs> it's not the best sword, but it is a sword and can do sword-like things, which is pretty impressive. So that would be my short answer uh, for first time buying advice. Buy something you can use, fuck it up, learn about it, and then, you know, buy something again later. Uh, so with that though, um, I'm actually going to transition now to a website. I'm going to go over some of the manufacturers that have sent me review samples. There's a lot more that I'm mentioning out here, but I'm going to talk through the website of a manufacturer uh, or a couple of them and go over the options, what they mean. It's a good chance to, one, you know, explain all the various terms, but you can go to a a manufacturer like this and get a sword that is, you know, I already talked about a little bit more bespoke to you, or you can buy one off the shelf. Either way is fine. I think that what I'm going to talk about here is certainly applicable to off the shelf stuff and will at least give you an idea what all that, what all that stuff means. All right. So switching over to the websites here, what I'm showing you here are three different websites from three different manufacturers that offer mass customization stuff. And again, I'm, I'm only referencing these because I've had samples from the vendors before I've, I've perused the sites and I'm familiar with them. And I would say the experience I've had with all of them has been overall good. Um, that said, there are other people that make these swords. If you've had a good experience with somebody else, throw it in the commentary down below. I'm not uh, Basically, these are the ones that I've used, and that's why I'm going over it. And each of these websites actually has kind of pros and cons. Um, I actually think Swords of Northshire is probably the easiest to use, uh, but I'm going to stick with the Jaku site, mostly because they have more options listed for me to go through. So that's why you're going to be seeing more of this page than the others. It's not because the other websites are bad or anything like that, but as I look at some of the options here, uh, they're a little more straightforward in terms of the choices, and um, this will give me a chance to talk through more options on a sword. Uh, so first size, Wakazashi Tanto Iaito. Iaito is generally a katana length blade, though it doesn't always have to be, and it is inherently dull. So you'll see options here like a stainless blade. Um, Tanto is a knife, Wakazashi is a short sword, katana is a long sword without going too much into the semantics of length. Now we're going to go over some of the options here. So 27 inch blade is what you're seeing here. Now bear in mind that the blade is supposed to be measured from the very tip, the pointy pointy bit at the end, 
all the way to where the base of the habaki starts or where the, where the blade meets the habaki along the spine. So that is supposed to be this measurement, which means that that habaki, that blade collar at the bottom, that brass thing, which would normally be where the rakasa is on a European sword, isn't counted in this measurement typically. You want to verify with the vendor to double check because some, <laughs> some include it, some don't, but it may add an inch. So this 27 inch sword is more like a 28 inch sword and the 30 inch sword is more like a 31 inch sword. So keep, keep those things in mind. Now blade length, um, if you're taller, you may want a longer one, though I will note that it seems like the vast majority of swords are made in the 27 inch range. And if you get something that they're making all day, every day, you tend to find better results. So if you don't care about length, you're probably going to be happier with the 27 inch sword. If you do, then I might recommend you go over to uh, whatever, well, whatever size floats your boat. I tend to 30, 32 inches. Those can be helpful training tools for a taller guy. Anyway, if you want something that's more proportional to you to what a katana would have been to a historic Japanese person some years ago. Blade steel. This is an important one and something I think is, is often just overhyped. Um, you see a bunch of different steel types. 1045, 1050, 1055, 1060, 1075, 1095. Here we have T10 and 1095 stuck together when metallurgically I think they're actually different. 9260, 5160, 6250, 6150. I don't know. There's a bunch of them. Um, honestly, I, I don't think it matters that much. And I say that because if you've watched any of the content I've done, you've seen me beat the pants out of a 1045 through hardened blade. It took a lot of damage. You've also seen me do, you know, fancy laminated steel swords where I broke those two. And sure, there's differences between them, but uh, not necessarily a huge amount in the sub $500 category. My recommendation, if you're looking for um, a good durable sword is to do a through hardened kind of, in this case, I'd, I'd go 1095 or T10 through hardened blade. That's probably going to yield the best results because um, they're used to it. Uh, at least the manufacturers seem to be 9260, 5160. Uh, th those are, are great steels, uh, but I think the, the forges in China tend to work with 1095 and 1060 a lot. And I think they, they bring the best characteristics of that steel out or at least get closer to it than they do with other stuff. So that's that's why I tend to have the best results with 1095 or 1060 in a through hardened variety from Chinese manufacturers. Um, not that they can't do better with other stuff. I'm just saying that's. it seems like a lot of the manufacturers seem to really know how to make a decent sword out of that, out of that steel. The point is that... Um, you know, there, there's a lot of different steels out there, but most people have a 1095 or 1060 through hardened option. And if you're looking for something durable to go wax stuff with in the backyard, I think that is your best bet. Uh, you'll also see here folded. So you see folded steel or tamahagane steel. Now they're not telling you what folded steels are included. It's usually two or more different steels. And tamahagane may not be the most appropriate word. Some people get sensitive about that because it implies Japanese made traditional jewel steel, which this likely isn't, but it does suggest that they're kind of making an in-house style steel, which is much more laborious unless it's going to cost more. Um, here you can see folded tamagane, 3,500 bucks to, to get something like that, because again, it's a very laborious process. Do I think it's genuine Japanese jewel steel made in a Tatara furnace with all the, the master smelter folk guys? No, I don't. Um, but folded 1095, uh, if I go over to the Ryan Sword folks over here, you'll see folded steel, uh, folded steel plus iron. That might mean it is an iron core. Anyway, tough to say some uh, what some of these options are, but uh, the folded stuff is basically an aesthetic thing, honestly. I don't find that it has helped. In fact, I would argue that it's often softer and tends to hinder in terms of performance, uh, but at, 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 a, at best it can be on par with some of these uh, homogenous steels that are out there. Um, I, I think it's an aesthetic thing, and if your idea is to get a sword that looks more like a traditional sword, then Tamhagane might be a good option. Folded steel might be a good option because it's aesthetically going to be closer to some of those historic Japanese style blades, or at least have more in common with them than the homogenous steel, but um, it's not a performance thing. So if you see it cost more money, that doesn't mean it's going to cut better or be more durable. It's an aesthetic thing. I think your durability option is, is best in this 1060 or 1095 option. That, that's my personal suggestion. The other thing that we often tend to conflate is here, blade construction. So we have Sanmai, Mano, Honsenmai, Kobuse, or Soshu Kite, kai, Kaite, I don't know how to say it. But Mano usually means one homogenous steel. Uh, Sanmai is like a, a sandwich of three layers of steel. And the lamination is different than the folding. You can have two different steels, one on the outside edges of the blade and one on the inside, that are both different folded steels. 
right? Um, theoretically, though, you could also have homogeneous, you know, not folded steels stuck this way. The idea of a Sanmai blade is, is that you're using two different steels with different properties to ideally get a better balance of a sword doing sword-like things. In honesty, I have not found that to be the case with any of these. I don't think that laminated blades, at least the way they come out of the, the forges here, tend to make any difference from a performance perspective. In theory, certainly they could, but I have not found practically that to be true. I have broken some Sanmai blades, I've used some of them, and I, I don't think that inherently they are less prone to taking a bend or chip, or that they are um, better. They, aesthetically, they're beautiful, and if that's what you're after, then these are wonderful options to do, and certainly um, closer to the historic way swords were created. However, if your goal is performance, again, I would I would stick with this like 1095 or mono and, and mono uh, steel over here. I would go 1060 carbon steel. Um, those would be those would be my choices. In this case, we've got 1095. That would be the the choice that I would make for for performance. Uh, specific stuff and if you want aesthetics then you know certainly choose different things i'm just trying to give you perspective on the performance side of things blade shape so this is interesting there's a lot of you know people say katanas are all the same there's a lot of differences here um we have shinogi zakuri shobu zakuri uh, uh hira zakuri that means like you can see this bevel here it shows a cross section but you can kind of notice this flat section around here is is missing it's one big bevel um historically these were more wakazashi tanto things but you could find some some katanas here and there that were also here as a curry they cut really well um so no, nothing bad there this is not common and i see this more in like chinese style swords but not not necessarily in katana so much Unakobi Zakuri, uh, this has some different geometry. There's a bohi down in this lower third, then the spine tapers, to kind of this diamond section slightly that you can see here. And then the tip swells out like is, is showing up here. It's a very interesting geometry. I really like the aesthetics. I don't have anyone to show you, but uh, there's there's one. Um, then you have some other, other iterations down here. This has the less reinforced tip. Um, the, the moroha, this is an old tachi style where the top third of the blade roughly is is sharpened with a double edge and comes to a uh, you know a double edged point. Alternatively, this is also sharpened on the spine but has a more shobuzukuri style style well iris leaf type tip with a reinforced point. Um, so a few different geometries that you can pick in a blade. Shinogi zukuri tends to be the most most common blade geometry that people choose. Each one might have pros and cons, by the way. Uh, a Shobu Zukuri blade, a little better at piercing, particularly if that, that tip is done right. Uh, Unokobi Zukuri, I think, is, is elegant, but it doesn't necessarily in, in, inherently offer any structural benefits. Uh, in fact, it, it historically may have had less structural benefits, but due to modern steels, a lot of those worries are, are kind of gone. Um, I, I think, you know, it's elegant looking, and then you have uh, Shinogi Zukuri, which is uh, it's certainly an easy blade to train with. Um, polishing. So if you choose something fancy by way of, you know, folded, tamahagane, laminated, doing a cosmetic or hayusa polish, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, um, either of those may offer some aesthetic benefit where you're going to see more clearly what you've paid <laughs> paid for in the sword. So those polishes can make a difference um, and certainly cost more money and, and certainly are worth it if you're, if you're uh, buying features in a sword that, that can that are there. But if you're not, and it's just a through hardened mono steel blade, then uh, mirror polish is, is generally sufficient. Now, in this, you haven't seen through hardened or not. That's another thing. So we, it, it's talked about differential, it's talked about steel types, but it hasn't said clay tempered or through hardened. Um, there's some bohe notes down here, but that isn't something that's necessarily noted here. I think on the Ryan Sword site, it might note clay temperate says yes or no. So bear in mind that a hamon is going to be real or fake if if it's been clay tempered, right? So you can get a through hardened sword, which means basically it's it's a, a uniform hardness, or at least supposed to be across the, the length of the sword. And a, a clay temper is where you know, kind of get the traditional hamon. I, I won't really go into it a lot, but basically it means that wavy line along the edge is real. And there's some differences. The blade on the on the spine is going to be softer and on the edge it's going to be harder and the pro to that is that uh, the edge it holds an edge longer so you hopefully the edge will stay sharp for a longer period of time 
and uh, and it well, it's really cool looking, uh, and it's also the way they were historically made. So that's that's good, or at least closer to the way they were historically made. However, uh, through hardened blade, while it doesn't, it loses some edge retention. It also has a springy quality to it, and so they'll snap back to shape. And if you have a bad cut, you're a lot less likely to chip your blade. It might roll the edge, but that's easier to sharpen out, um, and you're a lot less likely to bend the blade. And while they can be bent back, they kind of you know fatigue over time. So the springiness of a through hardened blade and not doing a clay temper, I think you could certainly get a lot out of that. Cutting edge, blunt, razor sharp, or sharp with Niku. So bear in mind that there are some trade-offs here. A razor sharp edge is going to give you something that is also fragile. So if you're bad at cutting and you're going to cut harder targets, wood, if you're going to t chop the top of plastic bottles, um, then a razor sharp sword may, may diminish, it may roll, it may chip. Uh, sharp with Niku is going to be more forgiving of bad strikes on even on water bottles, the hard plastic neck of a water bottle, or on wood or something like that. Uh, so sharp with Niku, a little more forgiving. Razor sharp, though, you're a lot more likely to get those bottle cuts where the base is, is standing. So if your edge alignment is good and your edge is sharp, then you can kind of get the, the bottle that's sitting on your stand undisturbed while the top falls off. Or you can cut through pool noodles relatively easily if your edge alignment is on. Sometimes it's tougher with Niku. Not to say either can't be razor sharp, but this generally means a more fragile edge, less reinforced. Bohe types. So you can see there's a lot of different bohe types here and I have some examples that I will show you. Let's talk a little bit about Bohe, this blood groove, the fuller thing here. So there's a couple differences. I don't have every example to show you, but uh, you can see that's this groove that's set in here. And there's a lot of different ways that they can be a lot of different thicknesses and depths and all sorts of all sorts of things. Uh, but in effect, it's a groove and they come in various styles. And how they terminate and start is also important. So this one just kind of peters off into nothing. And it also starts slightly above the habaki area rather than running into the habaki. If we move over here, you can see the bohe runs into the habaki. And up here it makes an attempt at terminating, but it also just looks like it got sanded over. Not the best example. On this example, we have bohe that terminate reasonably crisply, and this is an example of a double bohe. You can see they run into the habaki. The bohe on this folded blade kind of run all the way up to the tip. They terminate relatively crisply, but there's not a whole lot of room left. Just a slight difference. It's also very, very wide and very deep in this example. And you can see that it runs under the habaki here. Alternatively, this bohe example leaves a little bit of meat left on the tip, but you can still see it terminates reasonably well. Unfortunately, the rest of the sword isn't here, so I can't show you how it runs into the handle. However, you can see how the bohe runs in this case. Unfortunately, I don't have an example of every kind of bohe, but hopefully this gives you some idea of the options and what they look like in person. Now, what I didn't have examples to show you, uh, this, for example, is in Kobe Zakuri, where you have a Naginata-style bohe down at the, the bottom third, and then it kind of transfers to somewhere else. Uh, I didn't have an example that showed the the this kind of crisp start above a habaki, but this is also an example of a bohe that you might see. Um, also, this is a sohi, so notice that these double bohe are kind of on that where that flat spot on the sword would be, as where this little uh, bohe right here, called a sohi, I believe, is on the cutting plane, on the beveled area, so it's not on the flat section. The hamon type, so notice that you can pick a lot of different styles of hamon. And there are some really cool metallurgical effects. Again, earlier I noted the difference between a real hamon and, you know, not getting one on a through hardened blade. Um, and I do have some examples of hamon to show you. I don't have a ton of examples to share with you. However, I do have the basic gist. So if I start with the cheapest imitation hamon, you'll see this is an example of an iaito, and we have a wire brushed hamon here. Seeing that on a steel example, we can see here, this is what that wire brushed hamon will look like with steel. You can kind of feel it with your finger a little bit, uh, but you can kind of see how it hits the light and you can almost make out the uh, sanding strokes in the, in the metal here. Now some hamons can be etched on. I happen to have <laughs> the remnants of a sword here. Now this is a heavy etch, so it's not sanded on. It's done with a, a heavy, some sort of acid solution to put the hamon on. This is not a natural hamon, and thus far all the blades I've showed have been through hardened blades or, or not differentially tempered anyway. These are all fake hamons, and this is no exception. It's just under a heavy etch. 
The next example is one without a hormone at all. And so what we see is basically no hormone. Sometimes you can make out almost some ghostly images that look like it might be a hormone, but from what I can see here, this is uh, not a differentially hardened blade, and this is through hardened. There's no hormone or metallurgical effects, and that's fine. Very often, if you have a through hardened sword, this is ideal. Here's another example of a through hardened blade. This one's a little more prolific. This is the Cold Steel Warrior Katana. You can see I've sharpened the edge here, um, but you can make out that there's really no metallurgical effects. It's just a plain sheet of steel. It's not polished to a high mirror polish. It's kind of a satin polish, and it's a through hardened blade. Again, there's no hamon. The steel is uh, tempered to the same type of hardness, and it's going to give you some shock resistance, and you sacrifice a little bit of, of edge retention, but not what I found to be an enormous amount. Getting into more genuine hamon, this is an example from Estini Honto. Uh, not a folded blade or, or anything particularly special, but I believe a T10 or 1095 blade that's been differentially hardened. You can make out that they do a really good job with the hamon here. It's got a lot of effects, and that's kind of what you can see. You can see it disappears in some light and shows up really well in others. This is one of the easier to see hamons, but it's an example of, uh, well, at least aesthetically, a very pleasing differentially heat treated blade. Not all differentially hardened blades are as easy to see, so this is a Feilong Higo Katana, uh, right at the $500 mark. And what you can see is that it has a differential heat treatment. This one is a much shallower hamon. It's a little closer to the edge, a little smaller, and it's harder to see. I kind of got to flick it around in the light. Now, the difference is likely just the polish. So as we talk about polish on blades, know that, you know, the, the, <laughs> the more you polish it, uh, the, the easier it is to see some of these effects. So again, not a folded blade or anything, and the etch that they use, whatever it happens to be, doesn't really bring out the hamon as easily as the, the previous blade we looked at. The last example I have is from Ryan Sword, and this one happens to be a differentially heat-treated, folded, and laminated blade. And so this is an example of some of the metallurgical effects you can see if you choose an option like that. Now, Tamahagane might, might look quite a bit different, and these folding patterns and lamination patterns can look different depending on the vendor. However, this gives you some idea of, of what, those, uh, what that might look like if you were to choose an option like that. Now, obviously, Jayco is capable of a, a lot of different hamon types, and some of these are very elegant. Again, do just keep in mind that you can get them etched on as well. They won't look the same. They won't have the same kind of zazz to them, certainly. But uh, you can, even if you get a through hardened blade, get something that at least imitates the hamon from a, from a distance. The Kasaki. So kokasaki usually just means shorter, chukasaki somewhere in the middle, and okasaki towards the top. I have some examples to show. Let's talk about Kisaki. I don't have an enormous amount of Kisaki to show you. Uh, this might be an example of a Chu Kisaki. I don't know that I have anything that's a Ko Kisaki exactly, but you can see uh, kind of medium length. And ideally, the Hamon kind of does this. It wraps around just a little bit. Now, this is an example, again, of a, the same kind of Chu Kisaki. Um, and this has a much more pronounced bevel uh, or at least grind on the yakote area here. So this would be a geometric yakote where you can kind of see how the light hits it. The angle changes very steeply at the yakote. It's pleasing to some folks, but I, I don't really harp on this very much. This blade seems to feature it though. This is a Dynasty Forge Musha Shobu series katana. And this is one of the few examples of Shobu that I happen to have, and I don't think it's exactly 100% correct in terms of shobu, but you can see that there's a, a much more gradual taper to the blade. If I just put a yakote here, it wouldn't quite look just right. Uh, that said, I think the spine is supposed to kind of extend all the way to the tip. That said, this shobu doesn't have a yakote, and the 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 tip kind of comes down <laughs> at a little little different angle. Lastly, you can see here, this is an Okasaki, so you can make out some of the differences. Uh, basically, if the Yakote were about here, this would probably be a Chu Kisaki, and that just has moved down slightly. It's pretty much cosmetic. There's no real difference here, but effectively it creates the appearance of an Okasaki. Now, the Jayco site says Yakote, and basically that's just this line I, I mentioned kind of where it is. Um, some people get really sensitive about the, the geometric Yakote. I haven't really... I used to be more of a fan because it, it, for some reason, I don't know where it came from, the idea that it has to be, but I find that most historic blades are, 
are not don't have such an acute angle right off the yakote into into the the rest of the kasaki so i tend to prefer this more ornamental one versus this kind of stark transition may so i don't know that jaco has an example to show but uh the may is just the signature on the blade so has has may or doesn't i don't know that this is necessarily worth paying for though for the vast majority of you you're never going to take the handle off and if you're not going to do that then you're never going to see the signature um so knowing that it's there maybe that's of some benefit but that's basically what that means do you want the person who made it to sign their name let's move on to the handle so the length of the handle uh Generally speaking, I'd, I'd recommend going with like an 11 or 12 inch handle. Sometimes people want more. I think 15 inches or 13 inches even starts to get a little bit, a little bit big. But it depends on your preferences. It depends on your martial arts style. I tend to prefer like a 10 inch handle myself. Um, now it's it's easier to move your hands up though. It's not easy to add more handle. So uh, you you may want to practice with a stick or something like that and see where you you like to rest your hands. Generally speaking, though, I prefer something something on the shorter side, as odd as that seems. Suka shape. So this isn't something I have the best examples for, but there is this hourglass shape. Though do note that as you request it, sometimes it can be hard to execute on the blade and it makes the sword look a little weird. So sticking with this style shape, as odd as it sounds, there's a tang that fits in there and it's it's pretty tight. Getting this hourglass shape sometimes can be a challenge for these manufacturers to get off well. And uh, I find that I have better luck going with the standard shape. I do prefer the look and the feel and the execution of this hourglass shape myself. However, I tend to find better results with this kind of Hondachi style. Sukumaki. So, um, I don't think they show it here, but I have some examples to share. The next thing to talk about is the style of wrap. So you can see that I have a synthetic silk wrap here. Maybe you can't tell it's synthetic silk because you're not here and it's not the greatest camera angle. But you can see that we have the kind of standard diamond pattern shape here. This is not the worst example. The diamonds ideally are relatively uniform. That's not something you can generally expect in a sword in the under $500 price. You can't hardly expect it in swords over that amount. However, you can see that this is the kind of standard, I believe it's called Hanari Maki style. This is an alternative option, or we call it the battle wrap, Kitate Maki. I'm again probably saying or massacring these names, but you can see that we have kind of the standard diamonds, and then it wraps in a little bit in the middle. And then it produces, then we get the same diamonds towards the bottom. The Manuki, this one doesn't happen to have any in the middle, but they're often mounted in the middle. The Manuki in this case are still uh, placed in the kind of standard spots, but very often you'll see battle wraps with the Manuki placed in the center. Now, apart from that, they're talking about the Ito. That's the various uh, material and color. So, you know, pick your poison in terms of color. It's it's up to you. But cotton, uh, it takes lacquer really well, but it frays and stuff like that if you don't do it. It's soft and comfortable in the hands, but wears pretty easily. Uh, silk, uh, artificial silk in this case, it holds up pretty well. It feels cheap in the hand, um, but you can put lacquer in it to tighten it down. It holds up pretty well, though. Leather, this artificial leather noted, I don't find that this holds up very well. I don't think it ages well, and I don't think it feels particularly good in most cases. So if you can get genuine leather wrapped by like a competent um, person on the high-end custom side, leather can be great. In most of these mass production swords, I, I don't find it to be a very suitable option. It doesn't stretch really well. It doesn't maintain that tension particularly well either. Um, so I, I don't I don't find it to, to be a particularly good material for the long term. It looks cool, but it, I don't think it, it works particularly well. Same color. Uh, again, it's up to you. I will say that this black one, though, a lot of times the skin colors or the skins on these less expensive swords is not particularly high end, and the black will obscure some of the small nodules and blend things in. So I think black might be a, a wise choice. A lot of times the other colors to me, though, cheapen the look. Um, sometimes it can be done classy, but I, I find that white or black tend to give the best results to me personally. Uh, one other option here is you can see full same wrap versus oh and they do have a picture of a battle wrap down here notice how the manuki are, are placed in the center here um, but here we see full same wrap this one presumably has a panel you can kind of make out this this panel on the side where the the lights hit hits it there's this flat section here and then it kind of curves off to the side a full wrap of semigawa is 
you know, not something you're going to see necessarily, but this Samegawa stuff is actually really hard. It's not very pliable leather, uh, and it adds some structural integrity to the sword. Now, historically speaking, you could get a sword that had panels or a sword that had a full wrap. Samegawa is expensive. Sometimes, the, you know, you'll find examples of historic blades that only have panels on them. But if you can opt to do the full Samegawa wrap, uh, it does add some structural integrity to the handle. It makes it less likely to, if the, the wood underneath cracks, makes it less likely to become problematic in your hand and the thing holds together a little bit better. So highly recommended full wrap of Samegawa if you can justify the expense. The Suba. So there's a few different iterations, and I think most of these companies, whether it be any of the manufacturers I have noted here or some of the others online, probably buy these fittings from the same company, I guess, because I see a lot of the same options across many different companies. I tend to prefer the kind of iron uh, Tsukashi style cutout fittings as opposed to these gilded or, or uh, you know, colored fittings here. I think these, they're just not my style. Um, Alternatively, they have, there's a few different things. Basically, just pick what you like. But I, I personally would recommend something in iron that emulates Tsukashi stuff, something that's reinforced here. Doing some of these little frilly things here, it looks like there might be parts that poke your hand or something like that. Um, some of these really dainty things, they might be very light, but it looks like I would probably poke my fingers here and it might not hold particularly well. I have some examples to show you as well. There's a smattering of various suba I've collected from swords I've broken over the years that are all in the sub $500 category. I tend to prefer simple shapes like these examples here. Some have sharp little ledges like this guy or this, and they can bite into your hand, which can cause some discomfort. That said, I think they are closer to what they're trying to historically emulate, and in their simplicity, I, I like the elegance of it. It's a personal preference, however. If you prefer something like this or like this, uh, it's it's all in whatever you want. However, I, I find that very often these types of fittings uh, they just look muddy and they they don't they don't look as clean. They look cast and kind of poorly made in contrast to some of the simpler shapes that at least for me hit the mark closer. Sometimes you can get gaudy fittings that. I don't know, aren't, aren't the worst. This doesn't happen to be some of the, the worst example. Um, but at the same time, I, I still think it, it kind of misses the mark a little bit. What I would encourage you to be wary of are thin examples like this. Uh, for whatever reason, in the design of this particular guard, it, uh, it's only fixed at two points, and it basically bends really easily. This is a relatively inexpensive $135 sword from Ryan Sword, and one of the notes that are criticisms that I had in the review I did was that this guard was able to bend. Other guards, like this here, are a little gaudy for my taste, but functional. If you're doing a custom project, you can also ask if they have the capability of making fittings. This is an example of a iron or folded steel suba of some kind that was made by Ryan Sword on an example they sent over. It's not the same type of cast stuff. It's, it's different, it's smaller, but I happen to like the lines and it adds a little bit more character. I talk about this suba in the review of this actual sword, so if you're interested, I'd encourage you to watch that. However, the point is, if you want something a little bit more bespoke that isn't on the, the list of fittings you can choose, you can certainly ask the manufacturer if they're capable of doing something uh, unique, different, special, or, you know, even if this doesn't look unique, different, or special to you, they might be able to carve something specifically for you to your tastes. The Fuchikashra Minuki, again, kind of the same thing. Um, it's, I, I would say, less important than the Suba. Uh, but anyway, you just pick the ones that you like. I tend to favor the iron, simple versions. The Habaki. You can see there's a few different iterations here. I as well have some examples to show. So this is the kind of common brass collar that you're going to see on just about every sword. It's the default, so to speak. And this is one example of the Habaki choices you will you will inevitably get on most katanas. And if you're going on the extreme budget, uh, this is kind of the default that you're going to see on most swords. Sometimes the standard brass abaki has a little bit of character, some scuff marks or something like that, and it can add a little bit of character. You'll also see habaki that emulate two-piece abaki. This is all brass, and so it, it doesn't do the best job of emulating a two-piece abaki. It doesn't have the same contrast that you might hope to see, but there are others that do. This abaki, for example, has a rain pattern on it or some sort of scratch pattern, also emulating a two-piece abaki, but you can see it's just a sheet of copper that's been welded or soldered on to a standard brass abaki. Still an artistic effect. There are also habaki that tend to have this style of appearance, and this is emulating a 
historical style, um, but if you were to see the historical example, it's not at all like it. Still, it's an interesting pattern and adds some character. Some hibaki come polished. This is an example. I'm not sure if it came polished from the vendor, but sometimes you can make a request if you're doing a DIY build type katana. There are also silver hibaki or hibaki with various patterns or symbols etched in them. There's a myriad of different options here. These are just a few. Seppa as well. I like that you can pick the different colors and different kind of patterns here. Adding some combination of metal or keeping it all the same color can add some zazz to your color scheme depending on what you want. But I like that there are different options for uh, having some copper hibaki with brass here, some silver. Uh, I, I like the, the variety of things and the combinations that you can put together to make something that visually stands apart. Now there's the Saya, and I'll show you some examples in a moment, but do know that there's a variety of colors uh, that you can also pick from the Saya if you want to have um, wooden or black or brown horn, and then there are various Sageo colors. Um, in terms of the Saya, look at the variety of options they have here. I'll show you what I have around just to give you some idea of examples in person. You can see here we have a gloss bladder pattern versus an Ishime pattern. That's this stonewashed looking texture, and you can see how they hit the light differently. You can also note that sometimes you can get wood or horn fitting. So here's an example of wood, and then some of these are likely to be horn. Also, as we move on the mouth of the scabbard area here, you can see that some of these are adorned in horn, some of them are different color horn, and some of them are, are simply wood and how it lines up. There are other fittings that you can get, or at least decorations, so you can have a small rattan wrap like this, Alternatively, on the other side here, I have a fully rattan wrap scabbard. I tend to like fully rattan wrap scabbards, or at least scabbards that have some additional adornment, whether it be the rattan, like this example, or the partial samegawa wrap, like this one here. These tend to be harder to cut through. It's very easy to, to cut through this part of the scabbard and into your hand, so any additional rigidity or strength or something that's harder to cut through than wood <laughs> prevents me from hurting myself. Uh, there's also a lot of different colors and things like that that you can get, so uh, you can really get it to your preference. In the sub-$500 category, it's tough to find a Saya that really fits well. But fortunately, in the t at least at the moment, there's a ton of options out there, whether it be kind of ribbing like this, uh, Samegawa wrapping like this, rattan wrapping. A lot of these options are available in the sub-$500 category. It used to be that these used to cost quite a bit more to get those kind of additional upgrades, but now they, they're available. This is an example of one that Swords of Northshire made for me that has a, a custom moan on it, as well as some decorations further down the scabbard. Uh, that type of decoration is a little bit more expensive and tougher to get people to do at the moment. Sometimes you can find a vendor who will do it, but it's, it's tough to find. The other thing to note is the Sagaya, you can kind of pick what you want. Most of these are, are cheap and better ones aren't terribly expensive, um, but you can, you can kind of pick the color and it all all can sit together real pretty. Generally speaking though, I find that these Sageo um, can come in different lengths. You might want to verify if you have any preference on how long it should be. You might want to also ask that these little spaces right here, these are called shitadome, these little washers on the side, they often come out if you untie this knot, which you generally do if you're going to use the sword, you untie this presentation knot. Um, there are video tutorials on how to get it back if you want it there, but uh, these little brass washer things in the side come out really easy and then they scratch everything up so sometimes I request that they glue them in. On the Swords of Northshire site there's an engraving option as well. This is something I think you can request from Jayco but it's certainly a cool option to have an engraving, your name, or some sort of symbol or something on the blade. They can offer some pretty cool options. Alright so hopefully that has been an interesting bit of ramble rambleness. Um, earlier on I mentioned that recommendation is buy a sword that you're comfortable using uh, at a price point that you can afford. If you break it, damage it, and you're not going to get bent out of shape about it. Practice with the tool you have, especially if you want one as a no shit moment. And if you want something pretty, um, there's a lot of different options out there to give you a katana-like object. Sometimes you favor something closer to the traditional uh, look and feel and dynamics or at least materials or sometimes you want to go all performance and so long as it looks like a katana it's fine. Either one of those is fine. They're, they're all gonna work for sword related activities but which one is more important to you? Hopefully this video will I guess is at least explain some of it and you can decide for yourself where you want to spend your money. Anyway that's all I've got. Hopefully it's been of use. As always cheers and thanks for watching.